Hi everybody and welcome to our webinar series. I'd like to take a special welcome to everybody that is coming to us from around the globe. I know we have people dialing in from everywhere in Australia, but also some from Europe and the States. So welcome. I'd like to start off by paying my respects to the traditional owners, the First Nations people of the land on which I'm sitting. And you may have noticed my sort of fairly boring background. That's because I am sitting in a hotel room near in Perth. So I'd like to pay my respects to the Wajak people of the Noongar Nation and pay my respects to their elders, past, present and emerging. Can I also suggest it'd be great for us to see where people are coming from around the globe. I know we're all professionals with Zoom now. So if you would like to use the chat function to just type in uh, where you're coming from, uh, who the First Nations people are, so that I can read out some of those and just share the breadth of famous, uh, of absolutely wonderful, fabulous face, uh, places that we're coming from around Australia. Uh, that would be great. So please, you know, get your fingers walking in relationship to um, the chat function. And this is great. We're seeing people from Adelaide and South Australia, from Wurundjeri land in Brunswick. Um, there's Anna from Wurundjeri, either coming in thick and fast, Gadigal um, in Sydney. So hopefully you're okay with all of the water that's occurred. Uh, somebody from Italy, somebody from Barrel, somebody from... Um, this is coming super fast, the Kimberley, the Darwin, the Larrakia country, uh, from Tumut, from Meribah. So um, thank you so many. We've got so many on the call. I think we've got at least about 80 or so, which is great to see everybody dialing in from around the country. For those particularly in New South Wales, along the coastal region, um, our hearts go out to everybody that's been impacted by the floods. Um, and, you know, please, if there's anything that, you know, we as collectively as a nation can do to help, um, we know that it's been super tough this week and it will be tough over the coming weeks as those flood waters subside. We also recognise that other parts of the country, we've still got people in drought. And so it is very much a country where we have changing uh, seasons um, and changing weather patterns. Just like to discuss just a little bit of the logistics for this evening so you understand how we'll run this. Very similar to our other webinars, we're going to have a fantastic presentation from Professor Sarah Legg and then we're going to move into Q&A. So as Sarah's presenting, when you think of things that you'd like to ask, then please pop them in the question and answer function. I will then um, look at my phone, which is where all the Q&A will come up, uh, ask those questions to Sarah and we'll try and get through them as much as possible. We will also be recording this uh, so that we will be able to share that later. And if we run out of time, which can sometimes happen, um, then we will make sure that we get back to everybody on any outstanding questions. So thank you for joining us. It is great to see uh, people from around the country and I've just picked up some more people. We've got uh, people here from the UK, which is fantastic. Uh, we've got people from Gujamara country, um, at Pantherst and Victoria, from Cairns, from Adelaide. So welcome everybody. I think that's all the logistics. Um, I know that you know we'll all be dialing with the challenges or dealing with the challenges of technology. Um, hopefully we'll all be fine and no connectivity will be lost, but we will manage to have a great evening. So I'd like to start off by introducing uh, Sarah Legg, Professor Sarah Legg. And if you Google Sarah, you'll find so many citations, etc., that it's um, it's just amazing all of the work that she's done. So she is a professor at the ANU, a research principal research fellow at the University of Queensland, and has over 30 years in researching consultancy, focusing on the ecology. Um, Behaviour and Evolutionary Ecology, which is, I think, her original background. And what she's going to share with us today is about cats. Now, we all love cats, but in the right environment. So um, so please, you know, if you're one of those lovers of cats, as many of us are, um, you know, we understand that, we appreciate that. But what we're going to share here now is how the challenges of them in the wrong place. Um, and that's part of the challenge here in Australia, where um, pretty well cats are now everywhere and they are causing some challenges. So Sarah's got uh, a great presentation to share with us. And, it, you know, we're really privileged to have an amazing researcher, author, a sought after advisor. Um, she was previously on our science advisory committee. So we have been very lucky 
at Bush Heritage to be able to have somebody of her experience and skill to help guide our research, our work on the ground and the work of so many organisations. So Sarah, over to you. Thanks, Heather, for that um, sterling introduction and, and for this opportunity too. Um, so I, I'm sitting here in northern New South Wales, above the floodwaters, but on Bundjalung country. And um, it's really nice to be with you all this evening. Of course, I wish it was in person, but I guess we're getting used to these formats. Um, so I'm going to talk to you tonight about one of my favourite topics, which is cats. I am a cat lover. I think they're in the they don't belong in the Australian bush, but I actually do really love cats just to um, make, make any cat lovers in the audience feel a bit more relaxed. Um, and I'm going to um, tell you about some work that a team of us have undertaken over the past five or so years. Um, and Kieran, could you bring up the first slide, please? We'll just get straight into it. Yeah, so <clears throat> I see my name gets billed there on the front so slide, but there's actually many others in our cat research team and I, I want to stress that it's been a, a team effort. Um, all right, let's see if I can make this technology work. Try again. Well, here we go. Okay, great. Um, so the work that I'm going to talk about has been supported by funding from the Commonwealth Government um, through the National Environmental Science Program um, to the Threatened Species Recovery Hub. Um, and that hub's a collaboration between over 10 research institutions and then a large number of partner, partnering organisations, including Bush Heritage. Um, we started in 2015 and we're running to, towards the end of this year. And our charter has been to carry out research that um, aims to prevent extinctions and support the recovery of threatened species. Okay, I'll get the next slide. Here we go. So the CAT research is one of many research projects in the hub. And um, we've had field projects happening all around the country. Um, mainly they've been uh, aiming to, to trial different approaches to managing CAT impacts. And a couple of these have been on Bush Heritage Reserves. So in particular, Pullen Pullen, Ethabuka, uh, and also Arid Recovery, which of course is one of the close partners of um, Bush Heritage. But what I'm gonna to talk to you about tonight is um, some of the national scale analyses we've done um, that aim to build the evidence base for cat impacts and document what the management options to mitigate those impacts were. So I'll start at the beginning, which is where cats come from, because a lot of people ask me this. Um, there's actually several closely related species of small cats spread across Europe, Asia and Africa, and, and most of them can interbreed. But domestic cats are descended from the African wild cats. This is an African wild cat on the slide. And specifically, it's descended from wild cats um, in the Fertile Crescent and Fertile Crescent and Northern Egyptian area. And the history of their domestication is, is fascinating, but we won't get sidetracked onto that tonight. Um, just suffice it to say that at first the Egyptians uh, who domesticated the cat and then the Romans and then everybody else liked cats so much that we spread them very effectively across the entire world. So they've been on every continent. They've even been pets on Antarctica. Um, for periods of time, um, and on many of the islands as well as continents. And, and in that expansion, they've displaced some other small cat species that were themselves on the road to domestication. So that's happened a couple of times in Asia. Um, but this spread, this worldwide domination, came at quite a cost to native fauna uh, wherever cats landed. Um, so invasive mammalian predators have contributed to about 60% of all the extinctions that we know of in birds, mammals and reptiles. And of those mammalian predators, cats and rat, rats rank top. So they're the worst offenders in terms of causing extinctions worldwide. Let's go. Mm, doesn't want to move. Okay, so if we uh, zoom in now to Australia, um, 
Katz came here with First Fleet, so 1788, and um, they took a while to find their feet around Sydney, about 20 years or so, but from that point, they spread really rapidly across the continent. They were introduced later also to places like Perth and Hobart. Um, and colonists would, would help their move across the continent because they would often take cats thinking that they would be good at controlling rats and snakes. Uh, but it, yeah, it's 70 years across the continent and they're now found in absolutely every habitat from the wettest rainforests um, to the driest deserts. Now, more than any other continent, Australia has suffered massive loss as a result of invasive species. But invasive species includes the whole gamut of invasive vertebrates, invertebrates and diseases. But cats are a really important part of that mix. And in particular, they've really hammered our native mammals. Um, so since European colonization, we've lost 34 species that we know of, possibly more. And that, that 30, those 34 extinctions represent more than a third of the world's modern mammal extinction. So it's a massive fraction. And cats, of the 34, cats have been the main driver in about two thirds of those Australian mammal extinctions. And as you can see from that graph in the top right, that extinction rate shows no sign of slowing down. Of course, the problem um, for our native mammals here when they met cats is that you know most of our mammals are endemic, so they're not found anywhere else. They didn't evolve with anything like a cat, so they don't have mechanisms to recognize cats and respond to cats appropriately. Our fauna also tends to have slow life history, so slow breeding rates. And so they're just not a very resilient prey base for a very fast breeding and effective predator like a cat. So we worked um, early on with a large group of experts to um, look across all of Australia's non-flying mammal species and categorize them according to how susceptible they were to cat predation based on published evidence and people's experience. So um, we classed species as extremely susceptible if the evidence suggested that they really struggle to persist in the presence of even low densities of cats. So an example of that would be the booty at the top. Um, then you've got uh, a, a suite of species that are highly susceptible, so they can hang on in the presence of cats under some circumstances, but it's you know a little bit iffy. So the bilby would be an example of that. And then there's a heap of species that are either uh, not susceptible to to cats at all or, or minimally susceptible. So there might be other things bothering them, like the koalas facing a, a heap of, of other threats, but cats aren't one of them. So if you then look at how the distributions of those species have changed since colonization, you see this really stark picture. So if you look up the top there with the, the, the top pair of, of maps, you can see that the species that we class as extremely susceptible have basically collapsed. Their distributions have collapsed across the continent. They're basically extinct from continental Australia. The species that are highly susceptible have crashed and then the, the uh, low and not susceptible species down the bottom haven't changed so much. So you know, really for mammals, cats are a very big deal, like certainly one of the key threats, probably one of the top two, if not the top one. So that's the past impact. So cats have caused a lot of devastation. Um, but if we shift focus from thinking about past impacts to the ongoing impacts, a cornerstone, an early cornerstone of our work was to develop a clear picture of the cat population size because going back five years, believe it or not, we had no idea how many cats there were in the, on the continent or in the country. Um, so to do this, we gathered together all the density estimates from sites, uh, you know, spread across Australia that we could. There were over 90, so that's an unusually rich data set. And then we were able to um, use that information to, to model the spatial variation in density across Australia and just see how it varies through space and time. So what we found is that the cat population is fluctuating from 1.4 million during average to dry conditions to 5.6 million after in, in wet conditions. So what I mean by wet conditions is, you know, when you have the one in 15 year rainfall events, we seem to be experiencing one now, um, that affect big areas of inland Australia. They drive big increases in the prey populations and the cat numbers come up on the back of that and they take a year or two to come back down again. So the cat population's fluctuating. 
Um, so we also established that there are about three quarter of a million feral cats um, living in our towns and cities. And um, from other work, we know that there's 3.8 million pet cats. So it's actually worth just pausing there and thinking that most of the time, under sort of normal weather conditions, there are more pet cats in Australia than feral cats. We'll come back to that later. So now that we knew what the numbers were like across the country, we could combine that with information on diet, again, collected from lots of different places across the country. You can see all the dots on the map. These are places that we're able to produce or provide diet information. We're able to combine those two uh, sources of information to build up, again, spatial models for what the cat toll on um, various groups of species is across Australia. So if we look at these two maps first, for example, um, what you can see here, if you look at the one for birds, um, what the map is showing you is how many birds get killed by cats per square kilometer per year. So you can see the range there is going from zero to 60 and it's higher in arid Australia. There's a similar pattern for reptiles, maybe even a bit more accentuated. So in inland Australia, the toll on birds and reptiles is relatively high compared to the coast. The um, mammal picture is a little bit different. So if you do look first just at the left-hand map, you can see that on that map, in contrast to the birds and the reptiles, most mammals are getting eaten in southern Australia. So there's a band of red across the southern part of the continent. But particularly with mammals, or with mammals more so than the other groups, you need to think about whether they're mammals that are being eaten are native or introduced, because cats do eat quite a lot of rabbits. So when you think of it, uh, in terms of the toll on native versus feral species, you get the map that's on the right, which I think is just this amazingly horrific map, actually, because basically what it's telling us is that in southern Australia, there's a lot of rabbits and a lot of cats, and that's, you know, cats are eating the rabbits in southern Australia. And in northern Australia, there's no rabbits, but the cats are then switching to native, native mammals. Okay, so you can take all of that spatial information that's on the maps and turn it into overall tallies. Uh, you can, you know, cut and dice the information any way you like. So, but by converting it into overall tallies, we were able to work out that cats were killing 2.4 billion mammals, frogs, birds, and reptiles every year, and over a million invertebrates. And that graph shows you the breakdown for the different groups of vertebrates and also for the different groups of cats, so feral cats in the bush, feral cats in town, and pets. And you can turn that information as well into per capita tolls. So if you look at the last row in that table there, um, what that's telling you is that an average feral cat in the bush takes uh, or kills 783 animals a year, whereas a feral cat in town kills 461, and a pet cat kills 186. So you look at those numbers and on the face of it think oh pet cats aren't nearly such a big deal as as feral cats um particularly feral cats in the bush but that's misleading so i'll just take this table over to the um the next slide let's see come on there we go so there's the same table again and they've got the pictures there of the different sorts of cats but we need to think about the area that these cats live in um, because they're not the same. So let's add this row. Okay, so that's the area that they live in. Feral cats in the bush live in a much bigger area than the pet cats that in, in towns and cities. So if you convert the tolls into how many animals are getting killed per square kilometer in each case, you get a really different picture. So whereas in the bush, um, on average, 204 animals are getting killed per square kilometer every year, when you come to towns, our pet cats are literally killing thousands for the same unit area in the same time. So the, the impact of pet cats is immense. And there's actually documented examples also of populations or um, populations being driven to local extinction by sometimes just a small number of cats 
or um, the entire uh, breeding failure of local populations. And there's some examples of species that we know of have been affected in that way on the right hand side of the screen. Um, so the other thing that we're able to do with this information is um, ask the question, well, what are the ecological traits of, of species that make them more or less vulnerable to be, or more or less likely to be eaten by cats? Um, so with the same information on, on the diet, we were able to, to run models to see what, what made uh, a species more likely to, to pop up in a cat stomach or in a cat poo sample. And this is the results for, for birds, just to give you a bit of a flavor. But what it's telling you, if you look at the top left graph, is that if you're a bird and you live on an island, you're much more likely to be eaten by a cat than if you live on the mainland. And then if you go to the graph on to the right with the red curve, if you're a bird that's middle size, so 60 to 300 grams, you're more likely to end up in a cat stomach. Um, and then the bottom graphs are telling us that if, if the bird nests close to or on the ground or if it forages close to or on the ground, again, it's more likely to end up in a, a cat stomach. So we were able to take that the model that we developed um, from this data and turn it back and run it through, basically run all the Australian birds through that model and then rank them according to how likely they were to end up as cat prey, taking into account differences in their distribution size and their relative abundance. And these pictures on the on the left show you three of some of the uh, three of the top ranked. They weren't the top ranked, but they're in the top ranked set of bird species that are likely to get eaten by cat. And um, what a surprise! Up pops the night parrot on the top there. The plains wanderer at the bottom left and um, the extinct paradise parrot um, on the bottom right. So that's um, a lot of uh, huge amounts of data crunched, lots of you know fancy analyses to arrive at a conclusion that was actually I think summed up pretty well by Greg Wilson in this painting and in the text that he wrote to go with this painting in 2004. 15 or 16, I think. Um, so the painting shows a feral cat, that's the, the bigger animal, it's kitten below it, and then the stomach contents from the mother cat. And um, I guess the conclusion is that cats don't belong in the Australian bush, the conclusion reached by Greg and also by our, our big um, team of analysts. So that, that's uh, a really rapid, um, review of their predation impacts, predation on, on native species. But if that isn't enough to convince you um, that cats are a problem, um, maybe you need to think about the impacts of cat dependent diseases. So these are diseases caused by pathogens that depend on cats for part of their life cycle. So without cats, the pathogens and the diseases they cause wouldn't exist in Australia. Um, so there's what five, five or six key ones there. Haven't totted them up. Um, listed up at the top of the slide, and and of those, the most uh, substantial in terms of their impacts is Toxoplasma gondii, which is a single cell parasite that um, can infect any warm-blooded animal, including people. And um, when people catch this parasite, it has a whole range of health impacts from nothing at all through to pretty serious eye disease, miscarriage, congenital defects. Um, there's increasing evidence that it changes our behavior and um, also exacerbates some mental health conditions. So we did some work to uh, figure out what the economic impact of all those, uh, those uh, uh, health outcomes caused by the parasite are to the Australian economy every year. And we came to a figure of $6 billion. So this is a massive economic slug caused by cat dependent disease. We did a similar analysis looking at the impacts of these um, couple of these uh, pathogens to the livestock industry. And in that case came to a figure of 12 million a year. So, you know, there's good economic reasons to um, improve our management of cats and the impacts that they have um, on human health and livestock production. So what do we do about cats? Um, there's actually quite a lot we can do. People often think that cats are too hard to manage and that's not, not true or not true anymore. Um, 
So the first thing that we that we must do is prevent further extinction. And one of the key ways of doing this is by intensively controlling cats at sites with high conservation value. You know, for instance, sites that have threatened species um, that are vulnerable to cats uh, living there. A great example of this comes from the Kiwakura IPA, where rangers and traditional owners have been controlling cats around Bilby burrows and around Great Desert skink colonies. And there's now published evidence that these actions are helping these two threatened species to persist in the landscape there. So that's fantastic. Um, the second thing we can do is create arcs or havens. Um, now these are um, islands, offshore islands or fenced areas on the mainland from which cats and other ferals, including foxes, have been removed. And um, Australia is a world leader in, um, in this area of creating havens. And we've seen a very large growth in the, in the cumulative area, both of island and fenced area havens over the last three to five decades. And the projects are getting bigger. Um, so the, um, the most recent um, project that's been completed for an island, at least, is Dirk Hartog Island. And it's almost 630 square kilometers. So this is easily the largest island in the world from which cats have been eradicated. It's a massive, massive achievement. Um, so there are 30 fenced areas uh, in Australia and they get a lot of press, uh, deservedly so. Um, but actually, there's a lot of people are not aware that there's many more islands. So this map shows you where all the fenced areas and the islands are that are cat and fox free and protect populations of threatened mammals. Um, and there's actually over 100 islands on that map. You know, a lot of them are squished on top of each other. Um, and there's, you know, lots of opportunities to expand the number of islands um, that are used to, to protect threatened mammal species. And islands are really great because as, as well as having those populations of mammals on there, that they often um, are home to really important seabird colonies and other um, island endemics. So there's expanding the island network would be um, fabulous. Now, this, um, this approach of creating havens really does work. So all of the uh, species on this or the taxa on this slide, so there's actually there's 10 species there, but a couple of them have got subspecies. So there's 13 taxa. These guys now only exist within a fenced area or on an island. So if it wasn't for the havens, they would be extinct. We'd have to be adding them to the 34 extinct mammals that I've already told you about. So, it, you know, it's a successful action. But there's a lot more work to be done. So this graph has a list. The details don't matter too much, but along the bottom, there's a list of all the mammal taxa that we um, figured need protection on an island or a fenced area because of their susceptibility to cats. And what the bars show you is the number of havens that each of those taxa is represented within. Um, so you can see the protection is really lumpy. It's uneven. So some taxa are very well represented, especially on the islands, and then others not so much, and then others not at all. Um, and this little guy on the right of the slide, the central rock rat, is probably the species that doesn't have, it isn't represented in the haven now, and it's probably the one that most urgently needs protection or else, you know, it's pretty likely to go extinct in the next 10 or 20 years. So um, to try and address this issue of the lumpiness, the uneven protection, um, we did a bit of work to figure out where the next havens should be placed if we wanted to achieve that goal of getting all of these species protected in at least one haven most efficiently, like where should we build the next ones, uh, whether it's an island or a fenced area on the mainland. And from that work, uh, we think that if we built 12 havens, new havens, in the right places, uh, we could get the whole set of vulnerable species into at least one haven. If we remember, I said before, there's about 30 fenced areas now. Um, but if we if we doubled that number to 35, uh, sorry, to 65, 60 to 65, then we could get all the vulnerable species represented in at least three havens, so three or more. So it's achievable. 
but we need to bear in mind what preventing extinction looks like. Um, so take um, these two guys, the greatest stick nest rat on the left and the booty on the right. And um, these maps show you in the gray shading their previous distributions. They have gone from those entire distributions. They now only exist at the dots on the map. These are havens and islands um, that protect these two species. So, you know, it's great. We've prevented extinction, and that's really, really important. But the distributions have collapsed, and the ecological roles that they had in the landscape has gone. So, you know, we need to think about cats and what to do about cats in the broader landscape. And um, you know, the, the things that we can do in the broader landscape might not be enough to keep animals like booties and stick nest rats out there, but there's going to be an awful lot of other species that benefit from reducing the impacts of, of cat predation. In the last 10 or five or 10 years, there's been really important advances in technology that's allowed things like you know, larger scale and more targeted use of poison baiting, especially in WA. Um, We've got really good evidence now that reducing the rabbit population also reduces cat population and native mammal species benefit. Um, leaving dingoes alone in some areas is another option. And managing hab habitat, the second dot point there, is a fourth option that I'll just touch on a little bit more. So the reason that this works uh, is because the impacts of cats are worsened when other threats are also operating in the landscape. Um, so this is some work done um, by Hugh McGregor when we were working together in the Kimberley. And he had fitted GPS collars to a, a bunch of cats. Um, and this is one of a, the early cats that, that he had collared called Mike. And in that sort of uh, black spiderweb area of the map, you can see Mike moving around his normal home range. But whilst Mike was collared, there was a fire um, that burned very severely uh, to, to his southeast, about 10 kilometers away. To our complete astonishment, Mike left his territory, went cross country and spent a few days hunting in that far scar and then came home. And he kept doing that over the next uh, six to nine months. It turned out that all the cats did this. So all the cats that Hugh had collared would move off their territory and go and hunt in um, recently burnt ground if, it, if the far had been severe. And um, the reason that they did this is because their hunting success was much higher in this area and in these burnt areas. And Hugh managed to figure this out by modifying GoPro cameras. So this is pretty, um, pretty out there stuff. You know, we're going back sort of oh, six years now. Um, so that a lot of the technology was just, you know, on the, just on the edge of being possible. So he modified GoPro cameras so they were light enough for the cats to carry. So we were basically getting selfie videos of the cats when they were out hunting. And so from that, he could categorize, you know, every hunting attempt, whether it's successful or not, and what the habitat was like that the cat was hunting in. Um, so you can and you can see from that graph that the hunting success is much higher when the, the microhabitat around the prey animal was open. So the upshot of all of this is that if you manage foreign grazing to retain the cover and complexity of the ground level vegetation, you reduce the cat impacts. And we did some other work around it at the same time to show that the survival of, of small animals living on the ground was much improved uh, when you kept that ground layer um, relatively intact. So just to ram home this point, you know, it's one of the reasons that the work of bush heritage um, in its aim to restore ecological health to large areas of habitat is so important because it's one of the most efficient ways to reduce the impacts of cats and foxes over big areas. Okay, so moving from feral cats in the bush to feral cats in town, um, the, the key thing that we need to do to reduce uh, the impacts or the numbers of feral cats in town and therefore their impacts is stop cats from accessing superabundant food at rubbish tips, dump sites, intensive farm sites. The reason is that when the food is super abundant like that, you get cat colonies, so really high densities of cats. You know, you, you might have 80 cats living in two hectares sort of thing, um, living around that food site. And so their impacts in that local area are really high. And obviously they're a source for um, feral cats to spread out from that point. 
Um, they're also hotspots for disease. So, you know, we need to stop that possibility. And all we need to do to achieve that is to stop them accessing these food sites. Now, I'm going to stick my neck out here and say that um, we also should discourage as an option trap new to release. Now, this is a, a, an option that's um, very popular in the States, but is not used here to any great extent. So just in case people don't know what it is, um, you, you can see in that, that picture in the, the bottom of the slide there, it, it's when cats are allowed to live as strays or ferals, um, but people will go catch the cats. So you have to trap them, they're kind of wild animals, take them to a vet, get them de and then take them back and let them go again. So um, I've got lots of issues with trap neuter release, but I guess you know the bottom line is that if your objective is to stop cats from killing wildlife, letting a desexed cat go back uh, within its home range doesn't achieve that objective. Uh, and it's not an action that does anything to lower the cat population. Um, it's something that encourages, it's a, a having these cat colonies that are semi cared for encourages other people to cat dump. There's a whole litany of issues, I think, with it. If your objective is to stop killing cats at any cost, then it's a perfectly good option. But if your objective is protecting wildlife, then it's not. Okay. And so now, if I can get these slides to move, we'll move on to the last type of cat, which is pet cats. Um, now, you know, I've, I've mentioned that cats, pet cats, place a really large toll on native wildlife. So we definitely need to get serious about reducing those impacts. But it's actually the easiest problem for us to solve, technically speaking. It's simply about responsible pet cat ownership. So pets should be contained 24-7. It's as simple as that. And people are getting more and more creative about ways of doing that from all these fancy catio type, type arrangements to training cats to walk on leashes. Um, the other thing that we can do is uh, support our local governments to have stronger cat bylaws. Um, so that includes things like cat registration should be mandatory, cat containment should be mandatory. And, you know, if new suburbs are being built next to areas with high environmental significance, then we should consider making the suburb cat free. Okay. Here we go. Yes, so if we can um, manage that, if we can keep our cats um, contained 24-7, we'll end up with this situation where they're just delightful angels inside and we never have to see what happens <laughs> when they go outside and are let loose on the environment. So just to bring all of those um, options together, th there is basically now a menu of options that we can use to uh, lower the impacts of cats, which is quite different to the situation, you know, five or 10 years ago. And whilst we're using, um, you know, the different options on this menu, um, people are hard at work um, trialing new ways of reducing cat impacts, everything from developing new toxins or new toxin delivery systems, to using guardian dogs to protect threatened species from cats and foxes, gene drives, biocontrol, you name it. So the future is looking brighter than it has for a while. Okay, um, so I, I'll, I'll stop there and, and I hope you enjoyed that really rapid scoot through the world of cat impacts and control. And uh, on this slide here, I've, I've listed the name of some of my closest conspirators, but there's many more involved in, in this work and in our team, and um, I'd like to thank them all. Thanks. Thanks so much, uh, Sarah. Look, it, it's great to hear the level of, of depth and, and investigation that's being done on this issue. I certainly know within Bush Heritage, we spend a lot of time managing cats because we manage across such huge landscapes and we have things like um, the night parrot and plains wanderers. But what I also know too is, you know, the, the work of, you know, organisations such as Australian Wildlife Conservancy and the islands in those areas is critical. But we also have to manage it across the landscape without offence. And what I love hearing about is the stories from, you know, Bush Heritage Reserves where we've been able to tip the balance 
in favour of the native species. And I know here in WA, I uh, will be down in Albany in the Fitzsterling area and the work that the team are doing there across all of the feral animal management. We are seeing little pygmy possums that you can hold in the palm of your hand and honey possums come back back into the landscape, vegged areas. We know we haven't got rid of all the cats, but we've got them at a number, which has helped you know, keep them down. It's now time for Q&A. And, and sorry, the reason I'm looking down is just so I can make sure I get to all of the, the questions that we have. Um, and there's some great questions coming through. Um, can I please ask that you put them in the, the Q&A so that I can try and uh, make sure that I capture them? One of the very uh, first ones is a question from Laura. It's, um, do you think Australia's endemic species will survive long enough to learn how to adapt or survive the threat of cats? I know there's some, some research um, being done in a number of places like Arid Recovery on you know, adaptation. Uh, so do you think they can survive long enough to adapt or is it too late? It, it's a really great question. Um, so, uh, you know, I think the trouble with the initial, initial invasion of cats across Australia was that it happened so fast that native species had no time to develop any kind of adaptation to cats. Um, and I think they're always going to be at that disadvantage un unless we can help natural selection and evolution. And that's the work that Heather's referring to that's happening at Arid Recovery, where they're, they're trying to expose populations of native mammals to controlled levels of cat predation. So that it's not enough to send that population uh, down the tubes, but it's hopefully enough to um, allow selection to act on that population and over time um, you should end up with animals that are better attuned to cats and more able to um, to evade the, the worst impacts of cats. We don't know yet whether that will work but it's a really bold experiment and I'm, I'm glad they're trying it. Right. Um, another question here is about the uh, field implementation of toxin delivery. Um, with you know management of cats, so I was just wondering if you could make some some comments of where some of those sort of trials are are at at the moment. So yeah, Felixa so, and you know, you know, other technology. Yeah. So um, there was one big advance in um, toxins for cats five between five and ten years ago now. I forget the exact date, which is when the, the WA government um, formulated the the little sort of moist sausages called eradicat that cats were willing to take. So before that, cats wouldn't take bait because the baits were always meat baits or dried meat baits and cats weren't interested. They're really live prey specialists. So that was a big advance in technology and WA are now using those sausages really successfully over about 15 to 16,000 square kilometers a year. It's still a little bit less useful on the East Coast because native species on the East Coast are um, more uh, sensitive to the tenop 1080 toxin than they are in WA. So here over on the East Coast, um, people are trying to develop ways of delivering that toxin in a more species specific way. So that's where the Felixa comes in. So that's that gadget for those that haven't heard about it. It's so like a box, it's got a few laser beams coming out. And if the laser beams are triggered in exactly the right way, then the machine knows that it's a cat and it will squirt a dollop of poison onto the pelt of the cat. So, you know, that's a really, um, innovative advance and I think that that trap's going to be it's it's going through a, a whole heap of field trials and it's going to be really useful in some situations. Right thanks for that. Um, another question here from Dan um, where he's got if I assume a feral control is focused on cats then in South Australia the rabbit population may explode. Do rabbits then need to be controlled as part of the same program? No and yes. So um, it, it sort of, it, in reality, it always seems to work the other way. So if you uh, control cats, then you don't see increases in rabbit populations or introduced rodent populations. If you control the rabbits or in some circumstances, the introduced rodents, the cat numbers come down. So um, if you were to, um, I forgot the second part of the question. So I said no and yes. Ah, yes, but, but I think it's still it's very important that whenever you are um, designing pest management uh, programs that you should think about things in an integrated way. So quite often you do need to reduce the pest prey species and the pest carnivore at the same time. But in that particular example, um, you could probably get away without, without doing it. 
Yeah, look, I think I'd just add there too that a lot of the work that we're doing um, within bush heritage, particularly here in Western Australia, is about controlling all of those pests at the same time because we've felt that that is what works yeah. most effectively within the environment over here. Uh, a few more questions. I'm going to take one here, um, which a question is about, you know, as with fires, are feral cats drawn to other climatic events such as floods, uh, which I think is top of everybody's mind at the moment in the East Coast? That's a really good question. I don't know the answer to that. Um, I think it's it's possible. I mean, they're really, I love cats. They're just so smart. Um, I mean, how a cat knows that if it walks 15 kilometers over there to where there was a smoke plume two weeks ago, it's going to do really well. I, you know, that's incredible. So I wouldn't put it past them to know that when there's other opportunities that come about from natural disasters, but I don't know the answer to that specific question. Thanks, Sarah. Look, I know we've run past the time, but we've got three more questions. And so if everybody can uh, bear with us, I think it'd be great to be able to ask these questions you know, as we then uh, wrap up. So one question is relationship to, uh, is citizen science as a management tool being utilised at all with any of the sort of the observation or catch management programs that you're aware of? Um, yeah, so actually the, the Threatened Species Commissioner, um, her team had a go at, at at using citizen science or, or um, encouraging citizen scientists to help manage cats. So, you know, we had that, that cat t cull target of 2 million. Um, so the, the, the Threatened Species Commissioner's Office went to quite a lot of effort to gather information from sporting shooters associations and local councils, rural councils across the country, um, farmers, to try and figure out how many cats they were killing collectively um, and I guess also to encourage them to do more of that. Um, so I, I think, you know, I guess my assessment of, of, of that report is that there's an awful lot of cat control that goes, goes on, but if it's not well designed and not intensive and maintained and monitored, like the outcomes monitored, I fear a lot of that effort is a little bit wasted and if it was just better coordinated and more focused, we'd get a better outcome. Great, thanks. Um, second last question. Uh, what sort of monitoring and surveying is taking place within the havens to make sure that they remain, um, you know, the uh, predator proof and uh, cat proof as such? Yeah, so it varies. On A lot of islands are monitored rather infrequently, like once or twice a year or once every two years. Um, the risk of a, of a security breach, if you like, on an island is a lot lower. Um, but most fenced areas, you'd need to be, the, the fences need to be checked for their integrity, you know, once or twice a week. Um, because if a hole starts to form or, you know, a tree falls over the fence or something like that, you have to be onto it straight away um, or else there will be a security breach and you'll have ferals inside. So so the management um, effort of maintaining fenced areas is very large compared to the effort of maintaining islands. Uh, thanks for that. And I know sitting on the board of Arid Recovery, that's where we spend a lot of our time in discussions is about the maintenance of the fence, um, the regular yeah. expenditure work that they do, which is fantastic. Um, fences are great, but they do require a lot of maintenance. Um, very last yeah. uh, question, uh, which I think you know I'll probably uh, answer for. Okay, it's just somebody who said you know they pass um, they went past their mother-in-law's house. You know they you know, in a street where she's got lots of cats in the neighbourhood. Um, you know, wondering what advice to give her, and I, I think. My main advice would be if you've got concerns within an urban environment, then it's working, you know, with the council um, and who've got a lot of programs. In Victoria, we certainly have um, also the program run by Zoos Victoria and the RSPCA, which is really about, you know, safe cats, safe wildlife and, and helping to educate people. I know a lot of the councils have got some advice and support and can help with management. But is there anything else you wanted to um, add to that one, Sarah? Yeah, no, I think you're, you're spot on, Heather. Um, yeah, I'd just go to the local council. I mean, there's usually, most councils have bylaws against, this This would be called cat hoarding, and most councils um, wouldn't um, put up with that. But so there'd be, but yeah, you've got to just work with your local local council. And they often get quite frustrated because they, they need better support from the state legislation to, to do a better job on cat management. So they're agitating quite a lot to get that support. So, you know, there's probably things that you can do to support your local government 
get what it needs from the state government. So look, thank you everybody. Um, we've had a fantastic um, evening, uh, afternoon, depending on which state that you're in or which part of the world you're in. Actually, it may be early morning for a number of you. Thank you so much, Sarah, for sharing the, the insights, the research, the amazing work being done by a phenomenal number of organisations. You know, we really do appreciate it. Um, we are recording this. We will share this with everybody who has attended. So please share it with your friends, family. But thank you so much for dialing in, being part of understanding this story and how we manage a creature that is absolutely stunningly lovely and creative and all the rest in our homes, um, but is a major, major problem uh, within the Australian environment. So thank you so much, Sarah. Thank you to everybody. Have a safe, pleasant evening or day wherever you are in the world. Thank you so much. There's no one like you You rip apart the clouds in all my dreams Others are